Our next speaker is Professor Gloria Mark, who is just a few weeks back from organizing CHI 2017 in Denver, which was a big job. And uh, also this year, uh, Gloria became a member of the CHI Academy, which is a uh, very uh, highly uh, selective award in the human computer interaction community. And Gloria's been doing a lot of work on um, behaviors in the workplace. I think you, uh, some of you have heard her talks before about interruptions. And this is going to be a talk on her latest work in biometrics. Thank you. So um, this, this talk is a bit of a departure from talking about software. It's more human-centered. However, um, I, I do work with a lot of data. So in that sense, it's a continuation. So this is the question that's been plaguing me for a number of years. How has our digital media experience affected our day-to-day -day lives? And I'm going to talk about our, our day-to-day -day work lives. But before I begin, let me, um, let's bring us back uh, into uh, history for a little bit. And um, when I first started thinking about this question, I wanted to see, has anyone ever studied anything like it? And it turns out, no. But the closest thing we could find is that there were some early studies where people had shadowed people in the workplace and looked at how they distributed their time over the work day. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> these uh, two columns on the right represent studies where email had been uh, introduced into the workplace, and, and these were uh, workplaces that were heavy users of IT. And the workplaces prior did really, they didn't have heavy use of IT. So if you look at it a little bit carefully, what do you think has changed? And look at these two rows in particular. And you see that there's a trend between these two studies on the right and these past studies, uh, between desk work and scheduled meetings. This is a bit of an anomaly, so maybe you don't want to look at that too much. But here's what's changed. So first of all, the proportion of time that is spent at desk, uh, desk work since IT has been introduced has nearly doubled. And people spend a much less proportion of their time <coughs> in face-to-face -face formal meetings. So things like desktop conferencing, email, all of these things have slowly replaced formal face-to-face -face meetings. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the consequences of that. But first, let me say, let me talk about my approach. So I like to study people, uh, but to study people, to really understand their digital workplace experience, you have to go where people are. You can't bring them into the laboratory. So I like to study what I call living laboratories, and that means where people are in their natural habitats. At the same time, we're experiencing a revolution in the development and use of sensor technology. So how many of you wear Fitbits or something similar, track your steps? Okay, so this is the quantified self movement, and what I think of is taking quantified self and moving it into quantified crowd where I can look at this kind of data in the aggregate. So there's a lot of reasons why I'm interested in studying behavior at a scale like this. First of all, there's a scientific reason because you can collect big data. It's actually small big data. It's, it's data, data points maybe in the hundreds of thousands, not in the millions. Uh, but you can test theories about human behavior, uh, there's methodological reasons because if you use this kind of um, quantified self technology, and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit, uh, you can get very objective precision measures in C2. That means exactly where people are. Uh, you can understand the workplace experience, so what affects mood and attention and distraction. And last, I mean, these results can be used to develop products <coughs> that can serve as interventions to make people's lives better, to reduce stress, for example, make people focus more. 
So two projects that I've been uh, working on in the last few years, one is called the Health Sense Project, which focuses on the workplace. The other is the Millennial Project, which focuses on millennials, and millennials are the future information workers of our, of our society. Uh, just very quickly, I use a, a lot of different kinds of measures. I use uh, heart rate monitors, which provide heart rate variability, a measure of stress. I uh, use probes, which these are probes that come up on the phone or desktop, where people report uh, behavioral measures. How do you feel at this moment? And then the time is recorded. We log people's computer and phone activity, do activity tracking, measure sleep. And then all of these different measures are synced together in time so that we get a really nice picture at any point in time, what are all the different experiences that are going on. So let me present just some of the results that we've been looking at with this kind of data collection. And uh, the first question, it's something I've been very interested in for a while, is you know, does digital media use lead to fragmented attention? And if so, how fragmented is our attention? And it turns out quite a bit. And if you look at uh, people's <coughs> computer usage, you see that the median length of time that people focus on any computer screen is about 40 seconds. That's, that's pretty short because you're looking at it, you know, day in and day out. We've looked at about 72 people, uh, about 12 business days, and these are the kinds of findings we're seeing. So 40 seconds is really not a very long period of time. And we find that there are individual differences. So people who score high in neuroticism, this is a <laughs> personality measure. I, I am a neurotic. I score high. Uh, people who score high in a personality trait that makes them susceptible to, be, to impulsive behavior, and people who experience stress. These are the people you can predict that they will have shorter attention spans on, uh, when working on their computer. Uh, interruptions are not all the same. There are what we call external interruptions, interruptions from a colleague or from uh, an email notification or Facebook notification, some external source. But there's also this really weird phenomenon, if you're observing people, where they interrupt themselves. And they're <laughs> typing in a Word document, suddenly stop, interrupt themselves, check email, or pick up the phone. And we find, in fact, that if we look at patterns of the interplay of external and internal interruptions over you know, uh, large, large patterns of this data, we find that if people are experiencing periods of lots of external interruptions, and when those external interruptions wane, they start self-interrupting. It's as though people are in this mode, this interruption mode in the workplace, where if you're not getting an interruption from some outside source, your internal interruptions kick in. And this, this helps um, support this short attention span that we're seeing. Now, there's a lot of studies uh, in psychology that have looked at attention focus. And it's gone by various names, cognitive absorption. Uh, you've probably heard the term mindfulness or flow. And these kinds of attention states have always been associated with positive affect. People are happy when they pay attention. When people are bored, this has been associated with negative affect. People are not very happy. Here's what we find. If we actually unpack this idea of attentional state, we find that people can be focused and, and doing challenging work, but you can also be focused and do work that's not challenging, like when you play solitaire, right? You're, you're focused, but you know you're, it's not challenging. People are happiest when they're doing this kind of rote, solitaire kind of work. 
So it's it's a bit of a misnomer <laughs> to think that you know people are paying attention, focused, and happy. No, they're happiest when the work does not involve challenge. <laughs> so let's talk about distraction because this is uh, something that we see a lot in the workplace. Distraction's a big topic, and we just focused on distraction due to workplace <coughs> communications. The three most common kinds of workplace communications are email, face-to-face, -face, and Facebook. Email is primarily work-related. You can have personal email. In our workplace, it was primarily work-related. You can have face-to-face, -face, which can be either work-related or social. Or you can have uh, <coughs> Facebook, which is primarily social. And email and face-to-face -face comprise about 40% of interruptions. Now, there's this assumption that you know people, they're working really hard, and then they check Facebook, it distracts them, and then they get bored and they surf through Facebook. And we decided to maybe challenge this assumption because maybe the direction of causality is reversed. Maybe people are first bored, which then drives them to interrupt themselves and, and go on Facebook. And so uh, we did have these probes that I told you about where people would, you would get a probe and you would report uh, certain aspects of your attention. I, I won't go into that in detail. <coughs> But we had lots and lots of uh, examples of these kinds of pros, probes, broad patterns over different people, over uh, the work days. And what we did is we looked at the time instance when the probes were given and what people's attentional states were. And then we looked at what kind of communication people did, if, if they did <coughs> any. And of course, we had to control for the kind of communication it, that they might have been doing before. And here's what we find. We find that when people engage in Facebook, they are either experiencing rote or bored kinds of attentional <coughs> states prior. When people are doing face-to-face, uh, -face, also they're experiencing rote or bored attentional states. Email is flipped. Uh, people are really focused before they go into email which, uh, this is a spoiler alert, but this could explain the stress that people experience with email. So what this result suggests is that it's actually the attentional state that a person experiences that makes them susceptible to a particular kind of distraction. A workplace mood. Had lots of theories about workplace mood. I, I won't go into them, but I will say that from this data collection, we were able to explain nearly 50% of the variance of people's workplace mood, which for any of you that do social science research, to even explain 20% of the variance is, is a big deal. And people who sleep have shorter sleep the night before, who have difficulty in concentrating, who spend longer amounts of time on email, who feel they have lower workplace productivity, actually experience work, worse workplace moods at the end of the day. Strangely, <coughs> despite a number of studies that report, you know, the more physical activity you do in the workplace, the better your mood, and these are based on self-reports. When we use this kind of precision tracking, we find absolutely no relationship. Let's talk about email. That's everybody's bane is email. So um, first of all, what do the statistics say? So people average checking email about 77 times a day in the workplace. Uh, they're, they average about an hour and 23 minutes on email. So you know, email uh, comprises a, a good portion of the day. Um, about five years ago, I really wanted to see if we could create an environment where people could be more focused without email. It took me six years to find an organization willing to let themselves be cut off from email for a period of five business days, found them, and it turns out that without email, compared to a baseline where they have you know, a normal day with email, they have significantly longer focus 
and their stress is significantly less. This, these numbers might seem odd, but that's because heart rate variability, a measure of stress, is counterintuitive. The higher the variability, the less stressed you are. And we find, this is a very robust finding, we control for every possible thing we can think of, people's work role and gender and experience and job strain, and despite that, the more time that people spend on email, the higher their stress. I mean, you control for all these things and you see in real time they go on email and stress goes up. Uh, I just want to say about uh, digital work breaks, which is something that we're looking at. Uh, digital work breaks are really important. In fact, uh, current work shows that when you take digital work breaks away, people continue to work and get more stressed. And mm -hmm. Facebook actually affords a very useful kind of break for people in the workplace where they can be in control of their time and their interactions. And uh, another study that we just did looked at the effects of blue light in the workplace. And we're starting to look at interventions to reduce stress and, we, and uh, increase attention. And we find that exposure to 20 minutes of blue light a day in the workplace leads to significantly higher convergent thinking. It's a measure associated with creativity. And in fact, we also looked at taking a 20 minute walk outside which leads to significantly higher uh, divergent thinking, which is generation of different kinds of ideas. <clears throat> and let me just uh, close by talking about millennials, the future information workers. And we find that um, there are lots of interesting relationships, but let me just talk about one. Sleep is endemic in college life. And we find that one of the impacts of having uh, poor quality sleep Poor sleep hygiene is that the less sleep you have, uh, the shorter the focus duration on the computer screen the next day, which you might expect. But as a result, uh, people turn to Facebook because it's lightweight. So if you're wondering why, uh, why young people are spending lots of time on Facebook, you may want to look at sleep patterns. So let me just close by saying we are living in an era where we are experiencing changing social norms. And these are changing at rapid fire pace. We're seeing fragmented attention in the workplace and among millennials. Distraction is becoming a, a way of life. Uh, people are experiencing a cultural norm where you need to respond fast. There's social pressure <coughs> where, and you've got social capital invested in, the, in these workplace communications. So people are contacting you, you better respond fast. And it, it doesn't make sense for any single person to pull themselves out, cut off email, cut themselves off from uh, dis so-called distracting digital technologies. Because <clears throat> we are all interconnected. We are in this entire web of interconnected communication. Any single person would penalize themselves. So we need to think of solutions that are more macro that everyone can participate in. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, one question is types of work that was, was being done and time frame. One is, of course, saying nurses. They can work 24 hours. Yes. The other thing is different. Nurses versus clerical personnel versus accounting versus uh, software developers. Yes. What aspects, if any, for differences did show up or was it universal? Yeah, okay, that's that's a great question. Let me talk about that. So we, we looked at um, information workplaces. We didn't, we didn't look at um, hospitals, but very quickly, we have looked at work roles, but a, a better predictor of what people experience in the workplace is to look at job characteristics. So we use this job inventory that measures job strength, things like job demands, because you can have an admin with high job demands or low job demands, so admin itself doesn't say a lot. So we always control for people's job characteristics. 
And for the time, time frame circadian, did you look into that or pretty much you stayed during daytime only? Uh, we have looked at night as well. I didn't, ah, I didn't okay. talk about that here. Well, we might have to leave more questions for lunch or uh, other times. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks again.